Hello, 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 people. What's cracking? It's your man, it's Nicholas. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. BDGE, welcome back to the HQ. Another good week of football in the books, in the novels. Time to look towards week 14, the playoffs. For some of y'all, I have one league that's a 14 team league. Uh, and I locked up a bye for the first round of playoffs. So I have no fantasy playoff matchups this upcoming week, but I'm sure a lot of y'all do. That being said, this was kind of a wild week. A lot of really shitty football was played, pretty much. And I think the big theme going into the week was backup running backs, right? We had Eckler, we had Spencer Ware, we had a bunch of injuries and a bunch of things happened. And I think we found out on Sunday why these guys were backups in the first place, right? Um, and, and there's a reason why there was someone playing ahead of them. Regardless, that's not what this is about. This is about the waiver wire pickups, the guys you can add now that will have the best matchups going into the fantasy playoffs. Ooh, sorry, I'm messing around with the new mic. Hopefully this sounds good on the audio. I don't know. Um, let me know if there's any feedback on the audio. Basically, I am going to be feeding y'all running back and wide receiver positions. So people who are your skill players. Last week, we did a strength of schedule for the fantasy playoffs for quarterbacks, tight ends, and defensive um, special teams, right? So streaming options. And I made available to you the charts that I used throughout that video, and uh, I have updated them. So that will be the first link in the description. So we're not going to actually talk about quarterbacks, tight ends, defensive teams, but you will get an updated chart, the one that you had last week. Again, click in the link in the description, and you'll be able to download those um so those are your top streaming options and things like that going forward we're gonna hop into running backs wide receivers for week 14 and moving forward all right we're gonna jump into the ball carriers as always, everyone on this list is 55% owned in Yahoo leagues or less. So they would be available in your leagues. And this is in order of their ownership percentage, not necessarily the dudes that I want on my team first. Rashad Penny of the Seattle Seahawks owned in 30% of leagues. I mean, finally, we saw the Seahawks kind of talk about what they wanted to do throughout the week. And it actually came to fruition, right? A lot of it is coach speak. A lot of the time, they're just saying shit like, oh, we want him to get involved. Next game, Rashad Penny has like four carries. However, they actually played Rashad Penny a little bit in this one, um, and he played well. Now, he was still very much the running back two behind Chris Carson in this one, but he did play ahead of Mike Davis. And Chris Carson, as long as he is healthy, is the lead back there. However, he did dislocate his finger, so we're going to have to keep an eye on the injury reports when it comes to Carson. Carson played on 34 or 34 of their offensive snaps overall. Penny only played on 12 of them, which is not very encouraging, but he did touch the ball seven times on those um, 12 snaps. He carried the ball seven times, 65 yards and a score. So looking at this tweet from Frank Stamp FL. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce that, to be honest with you. Rashad Penny has rushed for 326 yards over his last 53 carries, 6.15 yards per carry with two touchdowns. Chris Carson, as we mentioned, dislocated his finger Sunday. So it is imperative for y'all to pay attention to the injury reports that are, uh, that are coming out because this could definitely be an issue for Chris Carson. Like I said, Seattle's not always truthful with their injury reports, especially. So we don't really know. Maybe this is to his ball carrying hand, his main hand, where it's going to be tough for him to hold on to the ball. So they sit him, whatever. If he does sit, at the very least, Rashad Penny becomes a high upside um, probably the leader of this running back by committee because they definitely want to see what they have in Rashad Penny, right? They use that first round draft cap on him. So uh, it, it'll be interesting to see how this plays itself out. They do play Minnesota at home next week. Um, so it's not a, necessarily an easy matchup, but I don't think it's one that you'd have to shy away from uh, just based on the matchup alone, especially with Minnesota being on the road. Uh, it's going to be tougher for them. So I like Rashad Penny as someone who has a lot of upside here, depending on Chris Carson's Injury. Uh, next up on this list is Rex Burkhead, who's been absent since week three, which made his ownership percentage drop to like 24%. And he returned to his first game action since like week three on Sunday. He only played on 17 of the 74 offensive snaps for the Patriots, but he touched the ball on nine of those 17 snaps. He carried it seven times for like 20 yards, caught another two passes for 21 yards. Um, and I'm definitely not ecstatic about Burkhead because he's definitely going to be a complimentary to one, Michelle in the running game, two, James White in the receiving game. So it's like, it's kind of tricky to see 
um, or to project his volume workload week over week going forward, which was always the case in the Patriots backfield. Uh, but sometimes, you know, you don't need to be anything more than that. Just like a complimentary guy who's getting double digit touches in this Patriots offense. So if you're desperate, he's someone definitely to keep an eye on um, because they play at Miami and then at Pittsburgh is a tough game, but they get Buffalo after that. So a couple good matchups in the coming weeks. And um, if anything were to happen to Michelle or James White, Burkhead's role would be very, very big, probably moving into like the RB2 conversation. Number three on this list is Justin Jackson of the Chargers, 22% owned man. Did he look good on Sunday night football, right? Melvin Gordon's out week to week. We thought Austin Eckler was the surefire RB1 filling in, um, but he was not the bright spot in the Chargers backfield. That was Justin Jackson, double J's. The only double J's we acknowledge over here in the HQ is Julio Jones, but Justin Jackson certainly made a push to be recognized, to be acknowledged. I ain't going to do it yet, but he's creeping. And I think... Justin Jackson is going to be the main ball carrier in the Chargers' backfield as long as Gordon is out going forward, right? He didn't see a single carry in the first half, which was um, kind of ironic because he ended up far outplaying Eckler by the end of the game. He saw eight carries in the second half, turned that into 63 yards, which is 7.9 yards per carry. Um, and he had a really nice 18-yard touchdown run to uh, to give them you know six. And he also caught a pass for 19 yards. So he was getting it done on all parts of the field, right? The red zone and the passing game, all these things. Um, now, Eckler saw 18 touches, but he turned it into 42 yards. He was ridiculously inefficient in this one. Um, and he dominated snaps, but it's clear that he's not going to be the every down running back that Melvin Gordon was while he was healthy. And uh, reports are saying that Gordon could be back in week 14, um, but they are playing Cincinnati at home. Cincinnati is obviously without Andy Dalton. Their defense has been miserable. They're going to be without AJ Green now, possibly Tyler Boyd, who got hurt at the end of the game. So I think it'd be really, really, really fucking stupid for the Chargers to push Gordon back into the lineup here because um, it, it seems like an easy win in my humble ass opinion. So I wouldn't be surprised if if they were without Melvin Gordon again in week 14. And what I saw, right, it, it, it would make sense for them to push Eckler back into the, well, like the Eckler role, right? When Melvin Gordon's in the game, Eckler is more of a complimentary back with pass catching upside. And I think that's what we're going to see going forward because Justin Jackson was just so damn good on the ground. I don't think they can ignore him at this point. And looking at Justin Jackson, for those of you guys that are kind of unfamiliar with him, um, he is not really big or, you know, does anything very special. Uh, six foot, a little bit under 200 pounds. Um, what is encouraging is his college dominator was in the 66th percentile, as was his college target share of the 86th percentile. So he could be very involved in the in the pass, <coughs> passing game if they choose to use him that way. Four or five two speed, um, <clears throat> which is just good at, in terms of a raw number, but it's not great for his size. Good burst score, good agility score. So um, it's not someone that you should be super surprised that did well in his role. Cincinnati at Kansas City, Baltimore, all depends on what Melvin Gordon's health is, but I would use a number one waiver wire on Justin Jackson and probably blow the rest of my fab budget if I had any left. I have zero dollars left in all my damn leagues. I wish you could like pay. I wish like you could be on Yahoo and then just put money towards it. Like, yeah, I need more fab budget. Here's five bucks. Give me a hundred dollars fab budget. I wonder what like if that was the rule, like if you could actually deposit money to get fab, I wonder what like the highest spender in Yahoo would be. There would definitely be people who are in like really serious leagues that would re-up like every single time a running back went onto the wire. I feel like that would hit the thousands of dollars. I'd probably fucking blow like $100,000. My league buy-in's like $20. Next thing I know, I'm fucking in debt. I got to sell at HQ. Y'all ain't going to... I'm going to start recording from the, like the side of the street. I'm all in on that. I'm all in on that, baby. Let's move on, though, to the next running backs. We have a pair of Baltimore Ravens running backs here. Ty Montgomery and Kenneth Dixon. Who would have thought I would put two Baltimore Ravens running backs on this list? They're 13 and 11% owned, respectively, Montgomery and Kenneth Dixon. Um, now, Alex Collins is obviously done for the season. Gus Edwards limped off the field late. He came into this game. He came into Sunday's game already with, like, a tweaked ankle. And then he left the end of the game, you know, limping off the field. So, it's possible... Gus is a little bit banged up or a little bit more banged up than we know. Uh, we don't really know much, right? Because I'm filming this on Monday, so I don't know a lot of the injury reports. And a lot of things I say will depend on the reports that come out within the next few days. 
Gus Edwards has seen carry totals of 17, 23, and 21 over the last three games. So there is tons of opportunities to be had here on the ground if he does miss time. Kenneth Dixon will take over as the lead ball carrier if he does miss time here. So Kenneth Dixon is the guy you want, depending on the injuries to Edwards. Tymont is more of a staple of this offense now. He's becoming more of a thing and, and like the real pass catching running back here. So regardless of Gus Edwards' health, I don't think it affects Ty Montgomery's. Because the the craziest fucking part about Gus Edwards and getting all of these touches and all of these looks, right? He has played on a um, hundred and I forget what exactly the number was. It was I think 134 snaps over the last three games, right? And he's getting like 60 touches basically over these last three games. He has not registered a single target in that span. It's all time out in the passing game, right? He came over a couple weeks ago. He finally started getting into his role last week and he's seen 10 targets over the last two games, caught eight of them. Um, he played on 27 snaps on Sunday. He's going to be a very, 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 very real PPR play this week because they play at Kansas City. They are in Arrowhead, which means they are going to need to try to match this Chiefs offense, which is scoring 37 points per game, number one in the NFL right now. So Tymont is actually a sneaky, really, really good play in PPR leagues next week. Um, so keep an eye on for what happens to Gus Edwards. Kenneth Dixon is a guy that a lot of people like, super talented. Anytime he's in, it's always a small sample size because he gets hurt or whatever happens. But his, you know, evaded tackles and his yards per carry are always among like some of the best in the league. So we'll have to see there. I would spend a, a pretty decent chunk on either of these guys if they're available in my leagues. Next up on this list, and this is possibly, this is probably my number one waiver wire pickup of the week, depending on reports. Again, Jalen Samuels of the Pittsburgh Steelers. He is completely unowned in all leagues, right? 0% owned in Yahoo leagues. James Conner left yesterday's game, last night's game, Sunday Night Football, with what Mike Tomlin called a lower leg contusion. So apparently that's a bruise in the bone, a bone bruise, right? Um, per Roto World, quote unquote, this has the looks of an injury that may force Connor to miss some time. Again, we don't know. I think I just saw a report actually that came out about um, it's not supposed to be a serious injury whatsoever. So we're going to have to, I'm actually going to do some little live research. You know, we always improvise on this MF. James Conner, injury is not considered major at all. Rap sheet confirms the injury is not to Conner's ankle and writes, it seems like he'll be okay. At this point, it looks like Conner has a good shot to suit up against the Raiders on Sunday. Okay, so maybe he does suit up on Sunday. Uh, I'm going to give you analysis as if Jalen Samuels is available and Conner is not suiting up on Sunday. Um, again, kind of similar to Justin Jackson in the fact that they're playing the Raiders, so I'm not sure they need to push James Conner when they're going to need him for the playoffs and going for further. So let's take a look at the man behind Le'Veon Bell's man behind James Conner. Jalen Samuels, six foot, 225 pounds. College dominator score of 23.9, which is under the 50% share. But if you look at that college target share, 97th percentile, 81st percentile, weight adjusted speed score, uh, agility score around the 70th percentile. He is an excellent, excellent, excellent pass catcher. That's basically what that college target share says to you, that 97th percentile college target share. There was uh, a lot of talks of him playing tight end possibly in Pittsburgh when he got drafted. They reiterated that they were going to use him as a running back. The most amazing part about Jalen Samuels is that on Yahoo Fantasy Football, he is listed as not only a running back, but a tight end. And seeing how bad the tight end position has been in fantasy football this year, there's a very real chance that you will, you know, that you will need to use him at your tight end position, which is amazing because if he operates as the lead back for Pittsburgh and you could throw him in the tight end position, which enables you to have another running back in your in your lineup, um, that's a major, major, major advantage. So I know he's listed as a running back tight end in Yahoo. I'm interested to see what he is in these other leagues, right? I don't play in ESPN, NFL, or CBS or whatever. So for those of y'all that are not playing in Yahoo, for those that play in those other leagues, whether it's NFL, CBS, um, ESPN, Sleeper, MFL, uh, Flea Flicker, whatever, let me know. Let let the other people know in the comment section what he is listed as. I know most of them, he's probably just a running back, but considering he is tight end eligible in Yahoo, he probably is elsewhere. So drop a comment below if you're not in Yahoo and uh, let us know what his eligibility is via fantasy football. So... Uh, outside of Jalen Samuels, the Steelers do also have Steph, uh, Stephen Ridley. He saw eight carries in week 10. That Thursday night football game against Panthers where they blew him out and James Conner actually left later in the game with a concussion. So he saw eight carries. Samuels saw 
five carries. Uh, but again, the game was a blowout, so it's kind of hard to tell what the actual you know workload split would be if it was a closer game, who they trust more, and things like that. Maybe they just wanted to get Ridley a little bit of a some field time. Um, so Samuel saw five carries in that game, but he was the main pass catcher again in that backfield, and that's something that makes this backfield so important to fantasy football is because the running backs always catch a ton of passes and Samuels being that guy would make him way more valuable than Ridley. I don't even know how involved Ridley really would be. I'm sure Samuels wouldn't be receiving, you know, the Le'Veon Bell, James Conner type workload split, like 80% of the touches, but he still would be very much the most valuable back. Um, And I have a crazy stat that I found this morning when looking at this, because not only is the reason James Conner so valuable because he's involved in the passing game, but He's scoring so many touchdowns. He's, he's getting so many goal line looks and so many goal line rushes. So I, I wanted to look, and right now he ranks second in the NFL in goal line rushes. He has 15 goal line rushes. So attempts inside the five-yard line is what we would categorize goal line rushes as. He has 15 of them, second in the NFL. Over the last, that's through 12 games, right? Over the last three seasons, Le'Veon Bell has played in 33 games compared to James Conner's 12 games this year. 33 games, he has 14 goal line carries. So he has played in 21 more games than James Conner over the last three seasons. He has one less goal line carry. Samuels will probably get the goal line looks here if he is, uh, if Connor is gone, considering he is big, right? 225 pounds, throw him in on the goal line, boom, bing, bang, boom, they ain't tackling his ass. So Oakland next week, New England the week after, New Orleans the week after that, Really good matchups from a fantasy football perspective. Keep an eye on James Conner. If he misses time, Jalen Samuels is my number one waiver wire pickup. A guy who is very, very, very close, though, on this list is Jeff Wilson Jr. of the San Francisco 49ers. Also completely unowned. Like, whose mans is this, honestly? I don't know. I don't know who Jeff Wilson was. I don't know who he was coming into this game. Um, you know, shout out to you if you had a single clue who Jeff Wilson was coming into, I guess I should say week 12 because he got a little bit of a, a, a carry load in week 12, but I, I don't know. Maybe that makes me bad at fantasy, but like if, if make, if knowing who Jeff Wilson was prior to this week makes you good, then I don't, I don't want, I don't want to be good then. I never want to be so entrenched in fantasy football that I know who the fuck Jeffrey Wilson Jr. on the 49ers, who was like the sixth running back coming into this year is. Anyways, let's just take a look at who he is. This is per player profiler. It's almost nothing good here, except for the college dominator rating of the 77th percentile. Undrafted free agent out of North Texas. Decent size for running back, six foot, 210 pounds. Um, all really not good on the metric side. So why is he on this list? Because on Sunday, he carried the ball 15 times for 61 yards, caught eight of nine targets for 73 yards. So you're looking at 23 touches, 134 total yards. There's a story behind this, of course, because what the fuck happened to Matt Breida, who's been playing so well? Apparently, Kyle Shanahan said Matt Breida tweaked his ankle in pregame warmups. Thus, Jeffrey Wilson was kind of shoved into the feature back roll. Um, Breida did end up getting five carries, only rushed for six yards, but he caught three balls for 51 yards. Matt Breida is like literally not going to have a fucking ankle by the end of 2018. By the time 2019 hits... Like, his New Year's resolution might be to grow back his ankle. It is injured every single game. He comes out of every game limping and then somehow plays the next game. So, we're going to have to see the severity of this injury. On one of his uh, receptions, one of his long catches in this game, Brita re-injured the ankle again, limped off the field, and then was not seen again on the field. So, it's totally possible that next week, again, he just battles through this ankle injury. But it's also possible that he does not and he misses some time. In that case, Jeff Williams Jeff, I don't even know his name. See, Jeff Wilson will become the main back here in the 49ers backfield. They play against Denver next week, which is a it was a tough matchup. They get three home games: Denver, Seattle, Chicago. So all tough matchups, and that wouldn't make you feel that good. But the good news about Jeff Wilson is he's completely unowned, right? And in dynasty leagues, this is a big pickup. If he's available on your wire, which he almost definitely is, you know he's a running back going into the playoffs that might first of all, get you into the playoffs or help you win the first week of playoffs because you don't see too many running backs in dynasty leagues that are unowned on the wire that might have a workload such as him. So keep a close eye on reports for Brita. Jeffrey Wilson needs to be owned in all leagues otherwise, though. And that will wrap up the running backs. Before we move into the wide receivers, as always, you can check me out on patreon.com slash bdge. That's where we give weekly rankings. That's where we give personalized advice. We have the, the community forum post on there where you're asking and other people are bouncing ideas off of each other sit starts trade questions shit like that myself and noah are 
um, in there answering 100% of the questions that come in. We do a weekly live stream every weekend as well. That's private just to the Patreon. So if you join me on Sunday, it's like that, but way more personalized because there's a lot less people and I get around to ask, answering all of your questions. So check that out on patreon.com slash BDGE. I also want to thank today's sponsors for the video. This shit is so ghetto still. I, I got to shove a boot back here so it stands up and doesn't fall down. But you know who it is. It's fantasyjocks.com representing your mans. They got the best championship belts, rings, trophies, draft boards in the entire world. And that's actually facts. That's big facts only because that's the only thing we bring to the channel, right? That is voted upon by FSTA, the Fantasy Sports Trade Association, which they actually, actually, that's an update too. They actually let me into the Fantasy Sports Trading, wait, Fantasy Sports Writers. Oh yeah, FSWA, not FSTA. I don't know why I said that. See, I'm a, I'm a member. I don't even know. I don't want to be in any club that'll have me, right? Who said that? Very famous quote probably took it way out of context and I don't even know who said it so it's kind of disrespectful but I have been accepted into the FSWA so shouts out me man I'm a horrible writer I don't know why they would let me in but I guess my clout has gotten big enough that they uh who's the guy Andy Barons is the guy who is like the commissioner of it or whatever the guy from Yahoo Andy Barons yeah he emailed me the other day he was like Nick we'd be we'd love to have you and I was like Jesus Christ you must really be hurting for members if you're letting my ass in anyways FSWA did vote as uh, Fantasy Jocks to be the number one championship gear for your league, guys. So go check them out. The playoffs are here. Crown your champion. Have everyone chip in a, a few bucks, man, and you can get yourself one of these, and you can get the history of your league engraved on these bad boys. The link will be down below. Use promo code TAKE10 or Taco Corp. TAKE10, the number 10, for 10% off your purchase. Don't say I never did nothing for you. Let's move on to wide receivers, baby. First up on the list for wide receivers is the duo out of Tampa Bay. Guys, I don't know how long I can just yell this at you without you guys yelling back at me that Winston sucks and whatever. Winston is a stud fantasy quarterback every single week outside of like one week in the last 20 games. If he plays a full game, he's putting great numbers up for your fantasy team. When he does that, there are people that will benefit from him having a great fantasy game. Those would be the pass catchers in his offense. Chris Godwin, Adam Humphreys, both owned in less than 55% of leagues. Adam Humphreys, 50% of leagues unowned. Chris Godwin is only owned in 46% of leagues. Here's what's going to happen. OJ Howard is hurt. He's out for the year, right? He's on the IR. Deshaun Jackson, again, I'm just a doctor, so I don't really know what I'm talking about here. He missed this game, and I think... This is completely a guess, and I could be totally wrong. I'm sure there's going to be reports later today that, that disprove everything I'm saying right now. I would not be surprised to see Deshaun Jackson put on the IR um, at some point today or this week. He's got this finger thing going on, and he played through it last week, did not play well, and then he couldn't suit up this week. So it tells me that it's not just like a rest thing. It tells me that it's like a, so, uh, like a I don't know, some kind of serious problem. If Deshaun Jackson is not on the field, OJ Howard, I mean, uh, Chris Godwin is going to dominate with a capital Z. I don't need to keep regurgitating how good Chris Godwin is when he gets a lot of snaps and Deshaun Jackson is off the field. Just take my word for it. So down the stretch, I see big games coming from Godwin, right? He went off on Sunday. And it, the great part about it is like, all right, so he plays New Orleans at Baltimore at Dallas. Mike Evans is consistently going to be shadowed or at least see the majority of coverage versus the opposing team's cornerback one. And Godwin is such a good wide receiver too that cornerback twos can't match up with him well. So he's going to, he's basically matchup proof not versus like any cornerback, but he's matchup proof based on the fact that he will never get the top cornerback and he is better than 95% of teams' is second cornerback. So I absolutely love Godwin going down the stretch. Um, he went five for 101 and a touchdown on Sunday. Adam Humphreys, on the other hand, went seven for 61 and a touchdown on Sunday. Both were top 12 fantasy wide receivers this week, barring anything that happens in Monday Night Football. And they get this home game against the Saints in week 14. Again, Marshawn Lattimore shadowed um, Mike Evans in their week one game when they first played. So I expect them to see similar coverage again, meaning Chris Godwin is going to get, Jesus Christ, some kind of um, mixture of Eli Apple and Ken Crawley and those guys. So I would expect him to take advantage of it. The over-under is not out for this game yet, but I'd imagine the Saints and the Bucks 
in Tampa Bay is going to have an over-under, one of the highest, if not the highest, of the NFL slates in week 14, probably like 55 or 57 or something like that. So I absolutely love Chris Godwin. If you don't need a running back, because the the running back waiver wire situation is mwah, rich this week, if you don't need to get one of those guys, right, you're stacked at running back, but you need a wide receiver, I would absolutely use my number one waiver wire on Chris Godwin. Humphreys obviously is a fantastic play PPR wise because he's just proven that his floor is so high. Second guy up on this list, or I guess third technically, Curtis Samuel of the Carolina Panthers, 17% owned they're quickly becoming the Panthers uh one of the 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 funkier kind of offenses in the NFL due to their weapons group right so Christian McCaffrey as we already know is like the hybrid workhorse running back along with just like a, a weapon a pass catching weapon here they're starting to utilize DJ Moore and Curtis uh Samuel as their other main weapons in this offense via Adam Leviton Carolina wide receiver snaps with Funches and Torrey both back DJ Moore 66 of 69 Curtis Samuel, 58. Jarius Wright, 39. Torrey Smith, 9. Funches, 32. Um, so, yes, Greg Olson was lost for the year. He is no longer a weapon for Cam Newton, opening up more targets in this offense. So, Cam is going to have to rely on Curtis Samuel and DJ Moore even more so going forward, right? Samuel is coming off his, his best career game in the NFL on uh, on Sunday, right? Career highs pretty much all around the board. Uh, he caught six of 11 targets, both career highs, 88 receiving yards, career high, added eight rushing yards as well. Look at this tweet your man's tweeted out this morning. If you ain't following me on Twitter, I would highly suggest you do so. Just as another fact, guys, I, I promise you, if I could teach you something, it, it, it make a Twitter. If it's not just for fantasy football, please do yourself a favor. Like you will get all of the breaking news in real time from the best people in fantasy football. Not just touting myself, but do yourself a favor and get on Twitter because you would have known about the Kareem Hunt situation two seconds in two seconds, way before anyone that follows other people on YouTube or any of those things. So go get yourself a Twitter, and if you want, go to my page at Nick underscore BDGE, and then just look at all the people I'm following. They're all football or fantasy football related. And follow those guys. So you'll have a good list of who to follow. Your timeline will just be awesome shit on Twitter that is football related. Um, that Twitter is not, that's only my football Twitter. I have a personal Twitter, which I don't do anything football wise. So if you want to stick just to football, do that. This is something I tweeted out today. We already went over the snaps, but Curtis Samuel is out snapping both Funches and Torrey Smith now. He has scored four touchdowns in the Panthers last five games. He has scored 12 plus PPR points in four of those five games, and he's averaging over 14 PPR fantasy points over the last five games. Again, Greg Olson is not there. Target volume is only going up. Now, the uh, Panthers will get three great matchups for the passing game over the next three. Cleveland, New Orleans, Atlanta. They are currently allowing the ninth most, Cleveland, the first, the most overall fantasy points, New Orleans, and the seventh most, Atlanta Falcons, fantasy points, two wide receivers on the year. Also, just to note, um, Samuel, Samuel, Curtis Samuel, has been running the majority of his routes on the outside. So this is not like any analysis to take away, but if some of you guys just assume that he was a slot receiver because he's small, that is not the case. Jarius Wright, who who saw a lot of snaps, obviously was running in the slot. Um, Curtis Samuel's been used as an outside weapon, which is interesting considering he's more of like a hybrid and I would I would think he was in the slot, but he's another great pickup. Chris Conley is someone I'll touch on quickly. 16% um, owned of the Chiefs, obviously. It's not exciting. But I really have very, very, very small amount of faith that we see Watkins return or just return successfully, I guess you should say. Um, he's been sidelined for the past couple of weeks, or he was actually active two weeks ago, but didn't play at all for some fucking reason. Um, Watkins is dealing with this foot injury, right? And uh, I, I have a, not a lot of faith in the fact that he's going to return, or if he does return and have any real sort of like positive effect on this offense. So without Watkins in the lineup, Chris Conley has played over 90% of the Chiefs snaps. Uh, and what's mo most interesting is that on Sunday, he uh, he ran nearly 50% of his routes from the slots. Um, so over these last two games, he has had 15 targets and he scored three times. And obviously just being a proponent of this Chiefs offense who is scoring an NFL high 37 points per game means that you're going to get a ton of scoring opportunities. And Chris Conley just by default is going to, and we've seen it without Watkins in the lineup, Chris Conley has been scoring. Um, like I said, 50% of his routes came from the slot on Sunday. And he's a bigger guy. He's a big guy with uh, a lot of speed. So it's an interesting combination that they put him in the slot. And uh, they get, you know, not easy matchups going forward. They have Baltimore at home next week, the Chargers at home the week after, and then they're at Seattle. Um, but Baltimore, however, has been very good against outside wide receivers, right, fantasy-wise. 
But if there is a place of vulnerability for this defense, it's over the middle. We've seen tight ends do okay against them. And we've seen uh, slot wide receivers actually do pretty good against them. I believe they're in the bottom 10 in terms of fantasy points allowed. Two slot receivers on the year. So if Conley is going to be used in the slot like they did last week, um, he'll certainly be on the flex-ish, like wide receiver three radar as long as Watkins misses Sunday's game. Over to Bruce Ellington, Detroit Lions, 9% owned. Super unexciting as well. Uh, He's taken over the full-time slot role pretty much for the Detroit Lions. He has seen 26 targets over the last three games, which is 8.7 a game. Um, He has caught at least six passes in all three games, and he's getting next to nothing in terms of like yardage and production from the slot. Um, And he has not scored in in since like, I think like week one, his average depth of target is a miserable like 3.6 yards down the average yeah a dot is like 3.6 yards which is the worst in the nfl over those three games uh the next week the lions do travel to arizona who have allowed the 10th most fantasy points to um slot wide receivers on the year so it's not the worst play but you could probably do better um outside of a full ppr league i definitely wouldn't think about throwing him in my lineup dante pettis is the next guy on this list and he is a really intriguing name to me uh 49ers three percent own right now it is it is Pettis time out there, man. Garcon and Goodwin both missed weeks 12 and weeks 13, and apparently they're both out indefinitely. Um, Pettis took advantage of that, right? Two huge games, and barring Monday Night Football, uh, the the Eagles and the Redskins, which I doubt anyone is going to overtake this number, but Dante Pettis will be week 13's wide receiver one in fantasy football. He caught five of seven targets, 129 yards, two touchdowns, which is coming off of a week in which he caught four passes for 77 yards and a touchdown. So two big games in a row without Garcon and Goodwin in the lineup. He was someone that I I really liked coming out of college. I liked him in this draft. You know, Shanahan um, traded up to go grab him in the second round. So you could tell that he likes him and he obviously wants to use him. And now he kind of has no choice but to do so. Their next three games are super tough, right? They play Denver, Seattle, Chicago. None of those are easy in the passing game. However, Denver did just lose Chris Harris um, for the foreseeable future, which is an upgrade to the passing game. Not super excited about it, but Pettis, is gonna you know i think he's gonna produce pretty well over the next few weeks just given the fact that the other wide receivers are not healthy on this team and the last guy up on this list of wide receivers my favorite free agent wide receivers on the year or on the on the week i don't know why the fuck i said the year zay jones buffalo bills one percent own he had a big game on sunday not necessarily efficient but he caught four of nine targets 67 yards found pay dirt two time two time baby Unfortunately, it's almost impossible to play him because he had this game on Sunday following last week's game where he didn't catch a single ball. But the week before that, he caught 8 of 11, 93 yards and a touchdown. So it's like you're getting super inconsistency, but you're seeing some upside and you're seeing some of the connection between Josh Allen and Zay Jones come to fruition. He also gets three great matchups in a row from a fantasy perspective. The Jets at home, Detroit at home, the New England Patriots on the road, which obviously they're going to need to score a lot of points. If he was dropped in your dynasty league, I would 100% recommend to go pick him up because he was dropped in a few of mine a few weeks ago and I picked him up at that time. But I think a lot of people probably forget if you just look at his raw numbers, right? This is from playerprofiler.com. He was ridiculous in college in terms of production. He he set the record for, I think, most receptions for a college wide receiver of all time. Pretty good size, 6'2", 200. But like, look at the metrics on the right side of the screen, right? 80th percentile or better in 40-yard dash, speed score, burst score, agility score, catch radius, his college dominator rating of 37%, a spark score of 88th percentile. So Zay Jones is not necessarily I'm someone like excited about and I'm definitely not looking to throw him in my lineup. But if you're in a PPR league and you are desperate at wide receiver, I think you could find worse options than the man Zay Jones. And that will wrap up the wide receivers. Again, guys, I have the quarterbacks, the tight ends and the defensive special teams charts available to you guys it's the first link in the description so you can go download them right there and that should help you kind of choose who you want from those positions rather than me taking another 40 minutes to break down what you could probably find in any other waiver wire video but there was a lot of options on the running back and waiver wire positions today so i kind of wanted to break those down in depth for y'all Go check us out on patreon.com slash bdge. Make sure you give the video a thumbs up if you found value in it. If you're listening via podcast, I would very much like a, a rating and review. I would appreciate the shite out of that. We're at like 97 reviews on there. I'm trying to hit a hundo. If three people that have listened to me all year have not yet given me a rating or review, I, I, you know, I'd love you for that. I would love you. So that's going to be it for today's episode. Again, subscribe if you're new to the channel. Thumbs up. Drop a comment down below. And I will talk to y'all on Thursday, probably, uh, with my video with Noah. Peace.